Today's scripture reading is from Romans 12, 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning and uh, good to be with you. And yes, the children, uh, dismissed for Children's Church. Um, I've been with you before um, this coming summer. It'll be three years since I retired from Christ American Baptist Church in Spring Grove. So I was in the association here and met Pastor Kelly through, uh, through some of our meetings and things. Uh, my name is Todd Whitmer. And, uh, and we're going to, we're going to look at... We're going to look briefly at a lot of verses. We're going to look primarily at one verse. So if you, if you just followed the reading of those verses and thought, oh, my word, where are we? Um, we're, we're, going to, we're going to move through this. Um, but good to be with you. And we've been hearing already about vacation, right? Pastor Kelly on vacation and Charlie just talking about vacation. And two weeks from tomorrow, I'm, out of, I'm headed out of town. Um, Begin with me, if you would, imagining, imagining yourself headed off to a vacation. Let's, let's say you're renting a beach house, whether it's a private rental, whether it's Airbnb, VRBO, however you do it, you, you've got a group of family together, you're headed to a beach house, and as you walk into the beach house, there on the island in the kitchen is a notebook. And in the notebook, it has instructions. If you've ever done this, you're familiar with this. Sometimes it's just a laminated sheet. Many times it's a whole notebook. It tells you where to get extra paper towels, what closet those are in, you know, where to get extra towels, uh, so on and so forth. Now, let's say you get about halfway through the week and all of a sudden something else comes up. Now, what, how do we... And you go back to the notebook... Flip through pages, and all of a sudden you find on the back of one of the sheets, handwritten, are some other notes. Now, these are from someone who simply identifies themselves as, I stayed here for a month last summer. In case you're wondering, here are some things that I would have been helped you know, to know ahead of time. Here are a couple of these. Don't run the dishwasher at the same time you plan to take a shower. <laughs> if you wake up early in the morning and wonder, wait a minute, it sounds like there's water running. Is there a pipe leaking? The sprinklers come on for the, at 5 a.m. For the, for the grass outside. It, it's not a problem. Or the dog next door even though he barks a lot, he really is happy. He really is friendly. <laughs> Cat next door, not so much so. <laughs> so what we're looking at in terms of these verses, 
the verses, the long list of verses that were just read, we're not going to spend a lot of time with those. But what we are looking at really is final instructions. Hey, by the way, if you're still wondering, for life together as a body of Christ. These, com- these happen to come from Romans. But the Apostle Paul, if you've tracked a number of his letters in the New Testament, he ends almost all of them with a section. Now, here, Romans, it's in chapter 12, because there are 16 chapters in Romans. But in Philippians, there are four chapters, and he kind of starts his final instructions about halfway through the fourth chapter. And the same with Colossians, three chapters, and he doesn't get to it until he's about halfway through chapter three. In Corinthians, you won't find it at all. He was just too ticked off with those people to, <laughs> to give them, you know, kind of nice greetings, right? Um, but, but most of his letters, he kind of finishes up, hey, you know what? Just some final instructions. So we're going to read some things. We're going to look at some verses that look like they're commands. I, I don't know that they're quite so much commands as they are, hey, If you want my advice, it would be a good idea too. Now, we wouldn't go wrong to look at them as commands maybe, but but they're they're kind of very practical advice. Let's let's take a look at the first go-round. First word, therefore, most of you have probably heard this before, but just a reminder, whenever you see that in Scripture, Look at what was just said before, because now they're saying, therefore, based on everything I just told you, therefore, uh, we're not going to look at anything before, because to tell you the truth, we've got 11 full chapters of the book of Romans that are before this, therefore, but this sets off some practical guidance. In chapter one of Romans, Paul started in Genesis at creation, right? And he's been working all... Abraham shows up and, you know, it's a, if he were writing to this congregation, he would say, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of the crimson thread, if he were writing to you folks, he says here, in view of God's mercy, but he laid it out. He has laid out in Romans in different words and probably using some different Old Testament characters, but using many of the same ones you'll be looking at throughout all this, this kind of series on the crimson thread. In er- I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, what He has provided in His Son and what He has provided throughout the Old Testament, in view of the crimson thread, do the following or be aware of the following. And notice where He goes first. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Paul has not been to Rome Most of the other letters that he wrote to, he wrote to churches that he had been a part of or at least had spent some time with. This one, not really. He hasn't been there yet, but he knows a church, a group of followers of Christ has kind of sprung up, and he's simply saying, look, just a reminder, don't get all tied up in trying to worship God who has provided for us His Son, Jesus. Don't get all tied up in trying to worship Him the way the pagans do at their temples, even the way the Jews do at their temple in Jerusalem. It's something new. Present yourself to Him. And then we're going to jump around here with this. Down toward the bottom, first of all, presenting yourself is is the best way. He simply says it's the best way to to know what God's will is, to, to follow Him, to serve Him. And down toward the bottom, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. You know, don't... Look, if you're, if you're worshiping Christ, use His example. He didn't get all full of Himself. He made Himself available to His Heavenly Father. So don't get all full of yourself. Again, you kind of hear some of the practical Paul just saying, look, this isn't a command, but if you want my advice, right? Don't, don't get full of ourselves, but rather think of ourselves with sober judgment. Now, if you're, if you're sitting here thinking, oh, so Paul's just trying to kind of beat him down. Don't, don't think too highly of yourselves. You're not that great after all. Notice where he goes next. We are one body with many members, and every member, you look through that, every member has been given a gift. 
Now, they're different gifts, but every member has been given gifts to use for this body. So it's not so much don't think highly of yourself because you know what? In truth, you don't really amount to anything. It's not that at all. It's don't think too highly of yourself, but also don't forget that you are filled with God's Holy Spirit and He has gifted you to do some things that only you can do. Well, and then he goes on to, to describe those different gifts. But the bottom line is, everybody has a purpose for the way God created them and what it's all about. And then in chapter 12 of Romans, he gets into this, he gets into this list, and we're going to go quickly through the rest of it. He gets, he gets in this list of just very practical advice. Let's see what, where it goes. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. The verses are there for you to, you know, kind of see at some point or if you want to go back through these. But that's pretty clear, right? Be devoted to one another. You'll hear a lot of one another's in this practical advice section. Honor one another above yourselves. Paul says the very same thing in some of his other letters, right? Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Just one of your announcements today, right? Working around the area of Harrisburg. Bless those who persecute you. Who's that sound like? That's like right out of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Again, very similar to the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are you who mourn. Who says that? Right? Who said? You're blessed. With... Yeah, it's just... Paul reminding his readers that after all of the theology that I just set out in chapters 1 through 11, therefore, keep this stuff in mind. Live in harmony with one, an, another one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. If you look these verses up, there's a lot more to them. I just tried to... Honestly, I tried to cut it down for the sake of what we're talking about to what Paul is saying, do. There are some other places where he says, do not do, and some other places where he kind of lays out more of an argument, but I, I, just, I tried to just be as, as quick and clear on this as we can get how practical Paul is getting. Be willing to associate with people with low position. Back to some of those verses earlier about we're all gifted, right? In this world, when... Status or knowledge or beauty kicks in, we, we can actually get so crossed up that we think we're more important than so and so, right? And Jesus put an end to all of that kind of thinking, and Paul's reminding them don't be willing, do not be, you know, be willing to associate with others. Regardless, do not repay anyone evil for evil, and do not take revenge. And if if any of you see that last phrase, do not take revenge, and you're, that's grinding a little bit on you, don't miss that verse and go back to see it because he goes on from there to simply say, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? That's God's business. So if there's somebody that, when you read, do not take revenge, if there's a face that pops in your head right away, just remember, you might, you might mutter quite a bit, but while you're muttering, hand them off to God and let Him deal with them because we take that kind of stuff in our own hands and we're creating all kinds of problems for ourselves. Okay, so you see, you see how simple, how, how clear, how, how brief some of this is. Here's where I'm going for today because the next verse that I'm going to show you comes right out of the middle of this whole pile of practical verses. The verse I'm going to show you comes right out of the middle. And it's one that in my retirement, I try to keep myself in front of Scripture on a daily basis. And you know how that is. Sometimes you read something, oh yeah, read that before. And boom, 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 you're, all, you know, you're, you're already filling out your grocery list you know, while you're reading the Scripture or something. But every once in a while, there's a verse that kind of jumps out at you. Right? And this next one, and it's right in the middle, because here we are at 18, 
This one's out of 12. This one jumped off the page at me a month and a half ago probably. And God's been working on me with this one ever since. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. For some reason, again, sometimes I just gloss over it all and don't even think about it, but for some reason I was thinking that morning, well, why did he put those three together? Right? What's Paul trying? All these other ones made perfect sense. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't seek revenge. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. This one, how do these, what, what am I supposed to make of this? And maybe I shouldn't have asked the question because he, he started working on me. On, on some of these. And I thought, the next time I preach, and I had no idea when that might be, but the next time I preach, I think I might have to work on these a little bit because God's kind of working on me with some of them. So let's start, let's start with the first one. Be joyful in hope. So hope is the, one that, is the word that kind of kicked out at me. And if you trace and kind of track hope, most of us think, well, what do you hope for? The Old Testament has a lot of hope slash wait. And actually, if you trace it, it's in the New Testament as well. Those, we're going to look at a verse in a moment that most of you recognize as those who wait upon the Lord, right? Those who hope in the Lord. Hope and wait. Hope is, maybe, maybe a, a definition you keep running into when you look at it and kind of research this particular word, Hope is waiting expectantly. Now, in my own words, just to try and kind of tease it out a little bit and try and figure out how I'm going to define it in front of all of us, here's what I came up with. Hope is waiting expectantly for God's will to be fulfilled. Think about it. In the Old Testament, when they talk about hope, what are they talking about? Well, sometimes it's hope that Israel will be restored, that the nation will be restored because these kings, oh my word, they keep messing everything up and we're got, you know, or the prophets are yelling about this and that and calling people. So sometimes it's restoration. Sometimes it's they're holding on to a promise and they're waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. Sometimes... Sometimes restoration, promise, sometimes it's rescue, right? How many of the Psalms written by David start with while he was being chased by Saul, you know, or, right? And, and time and again, where, where there's words of hope or the word hope, there's this idea of waiting for God's promise to be fulfilled. What are you waiting for this morning? It might not be anything to do with Israel, although it might be in this day and age. But it might be something about reconciliation and there's another face that pops up in front of your mind. Or restoration. Or a promise fulfilled. You are holding on to a promise of God and you are waiting for it to be fulfilled. Or you may just be wondering and kind of waiting for clarity about God's will. But you are waiting. What are you waiting for? Because this verse reminds us it's, it's worth waiting. Here's, here's another verse. And that's the one I alluded to earlier. If you're familiar with King James, if that's kind of what you grew up with, you'll recognize that as those who wait upon the Lord, right, will renew their strength. NIV, those who hope in the Lord. Again, those words throughout Scripture, many times used interchangeably. But do you see what happens? This promise, this thought from Isaiah is reminding us that waiting is not exhausting ourselves, not waiting in a biblical sense of hope waiting. 
waiting leads to renewed strength. Be joyful in hope. Some of you sitting here may be thinking, I've been waiting long enough. I, I can't imagine getting all excited about what I'm going through. But just a reminder before we move on to the next little phrase. These verses are there to remind us of whom we are waiting or for whom we are waiting. Jesus went before us. Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus faced all of the waiting. He, can, you can remember how much he waited throughout Gethsemane, right? Throughout the night. If the possibility might exist that, that God might change this plan, his father, but he wouldn't. And Jesus, who went before us when we wait, we wait for Him. We wait with joy. How many times, this is just kind of an open question, think about it, and, and the next time you're reading the Gospels, kind of look for it. How many times did Jesus' ministry, whether it was His, whether it was his coming into the, into the planet in the first place, or whether it was throughout His ministry, how many times is the word joy or an expression of joy used around the life of Jesus. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 4, I believe it is, even says, for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. So while we wait, trust in the one who is able to bring joy even in our waiting. So what are you waiting for? Before we move on to the next place, the next little phrase, I'll simply say this. One of the ways that God brought the, kind of brought me through all of this just recently was in the dentist chair. And if, if that makes some of you squirm, I'm going to be very brief, but anyway. So I had, some, I had some teeth work that had to be done in preparation for some oral surgery work that needed to be done. And I was hoping all of this was going to go smoothly right? Well, the next phrase is patient in affliction. So I had a little bit of learning out of all of that, but we'll get back to the dentist chair in a moment. But just, I wanted to set the stage, spend some time in the dentist chair in hope of things being settled and straightened away. Patient in affliction. The word patient here Another way of kind of explaining steadfast, enduring what we face. And affliction, affliction is trouble, persecution, oppression. Might be a little heavier word than we usually deal with, but certainly not for Paul. If you follow the life of Paul, if you've read the book of Acts any time recently, you'll know what kind of stuff he had to go through. And not only Paul, but Jesus himself reminded us of this. In this world, you will have trouble. The same, kind of the same word here used for affliction. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Paul, Jesus, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, we are reminded that trouble is a part of this world. We live in a fallen world and things, the wheels come off of the cart sometimes. Even the things we hope for, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. How? How do we get through this and endure it all? Well, a reminder. Jesus is saying, take heart. Look to me. Trust in me. Reach out to me. Because I have been here. I have been through this. I have worked this through. I experienced it beforehand. 
and I went through it, I can help you get through it. Be joyful in hope, and while we're waiting, expectantly waiting, be patient or endure some of the difficulty that comes. Now, we have Jesus' example, we have Paul's example, we even have Jesus' brother James in, in his book in chapter 1 simply says, count it all joy when you come upon various trials and difficulties. So we have the examples of these that have gone before us. Some t- Jesus' words here, in addition to reminding us of his example, he also reminds us, hey, look, just letting you know, in this world in which we live, this stuff is going to happen. So don't be too surprised by it. Don't let it catch you off guard. One more thought from Paul in Romans. It's not, it's not going to be on the screen, but just let me read it to you. Paul says in chapter 5, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in our sufferings. Again, Paul, what, where are you going with this? But hear him out. We glory in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance, and per- perseverance leads to character, and character leads to hope. So in some way, the struggles that we live through, as we live through them, relying on the power of Christ to help us endure and work it all through, in some way, it it makes a difference. It's not just, it's not just struggling for the sake of struggling. It's, it's working itself out. It's making a dent in who we are. So has your waiting... I asked you earlier, what are you waiting for? Has your waiting, has your waiting become more difficult? Something that you are now or can remember just recently waiting for and it got worse before it got better? Or right now you might just say, you know what, it kind of got worse. A reminder that as we trust Him, as we reach out to Him, He is working in us and He's working through us. Well, back to my dentist chair and then on to the third phrase. So, went to the dentist chair, had a little work done in preparation for this oral surgery work. So, on either side of where the oral surgery was going to be happening, clear and kind of concentrated look over all the teeth on and sure enough a cavity here a cavity there and one of those cavities after the dentist got finished they simply said oh by the way got pretty close to the nerve on that one so so you we need to get you set up for a root canal so I'm thinking, okay, and I even told the dentist, I said, okay, in like two weeks, I have the oral surgery thing taken care of, so do I do the root canal after that? And here was the answer. No, I think we ought to try and call for the root canal, maybe even later today, because I got close enough to that nerve that that tooth could blow up on you. I didn't like that phrase at all. (laughs) That just didn't sound right. Right? So my hope at the very beginning, we're going to get this all straightened away and then get ready for the oral surgery. And I've got a little bit of, you know, hope, joy, think, you know, I've got a little anxiety to work through about the oral surgery coming down down the pike anyway. But now the root canal, and now all of a sudden, you notice what happened? All of a sudden, my hope wasn't just, oh, in a couple of weeks, I hope I get through that oral surgery thing. Now I'm actually hoping I can get a root canal soon. Have you ever been there? 
was something you were hoping for and then it got so much worse and now all of a sudden your hope has even shifted. Just a reminder, God's not confused by any of this. We get plenty confused at times, but God's not taken by surprise. He's not confused by it. It it is something He is able to work and continues to work, even in the midst of complications or some of those, oh no, here we go. How does He do it? Well, be joyful in hope and be ready, enduring, right? Patient in affliction. When things get, when trouble enters in, things get more complicated, don't let it throw you off. Simply put, before this next phrase, when something happens in life to kick the feet out from under you, let's, let's commit ourselves to falling on our knees if we're going to fall. Because the last one from the Apostle Paul is faithful in prayer. And faithful here is along the lines of consistent or even constant. I mean, make these items an aspect of prayer. Keep them before God. Even even if the trouble that came is so disturbing that when when you hear me say, keep praying, some of you are muttering under your breath, yeah, I'll keep praying. I just can't believe God didn't come through the way I expected or the way I wanted. Even if it means you pray with your fist, shaking your fist at God because you're that upset. He's big enough to take that kind of stuff, right? He's big enough to take your muttering. My, what I would urge and plead with you about is when, when trouble hits and you've been waiting and now it looks like you're either going to wait a lot longer or the whole thing's going to just fall apart, please, we have a choice of turning toward the Lord or away from Him. Please turn toward Him. Because nothing good can happen if we just turn away from Him. We, we put the brakes on anything that can pot, hit the work of His Spirit to, to turn it around. So even if you have to grumble at Him, yell at Him, kick and scream, however, it doesn't matter. Just stay in communication with Him. Be faithful in prayer. And here, some of the... You, here's the prayer, Right? Very briefly, we, we remind ourselves, you're God, I'm not, right? Your kingdom come. You go first on this. I've got a laundry list that I need to run past you and, and kind of bend your ear about, but to tell you the truth, let's just start with your stuff. You tell me, right? And then, then we do get a chance to come around to what we need, and how we need to forgive and how we need forgiveness. And then finally, protect us, right? Because left to our own devices, not only does trouble come into our world, left to our own devices, we can cause trouble. So has, has your waiting period kind of been derailed? If so... Will you, will you turn to Him? Will you go from joyful in hope to patient when trouble comes and it all rolls apart and falls apart to faithful in prayer? It looks like an active kind of waiting. What does that look like in your situation? To be actively waiting. Maybe it means you study, you read, You pull in a prayer partner. You serve others, right? While we wait and and some of it, we do what we can and then there are some things you know that we're waiting for, that we're hoping for, that we can't do anything about. That the more we seem to try and get into the middle of it, the more we mess it up. So God might be saying, hey, take a step back from some of that. Keep praying, keep hoping, keep trusting, but don't keep in it quite so much. Well, 
Finally, your active prayer becomes something you can do, not just something you talk about. Something that you take steps to get closer to the Lord while the waiting happens and you continue to pray that He's doing something behind the scenes. My active steps while I waited, I did get, well, I, I didn't get the full root canal, if you can imagine, right? Uh, the, the, the dentist or the doctor that I went to see, the oral surgeon I went to see for the root canal, didn't have enough time to do the complete thing, so he packed it all, you know, did some of it, packed it all with an antibiotic, told me if, you know, we'll, we'll schedule it for next week. Well, about halfway through that time, I'm still feeling this pain and it seems to be getting a little bit worse. I'm thinking, okay. So I call his office and say, hey, I'm not trying to bug anybody, but do I need an antibiotic maybe? Is there something more I could do? They said, as a matter of fact, if you can come in this afternoon. I said, I can do that. So in that afternoon, and God had been working with me on these verses to the extent that finally, finally I just thought, you know what, Lord, whatever you're up to, you're up to, and you teach me what you need to teach me, and here we go. I didn't realize this whole thing was going to be a step between dentist and oral surgeon. I didn't re recognize and realize I was going to have this whole next little thing, but it's, it's up to you. Oh, I, and I forgot to tell you, the first go-round with the root canal guy, he said, if you feel anything at all after the Novocaine, if you feel anything at all, just let me know. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more Novocaine. So I'm sitting there and he's doing his work. And I'm thinking, I think I feel a little bit of something. <laughs> but I don't know that it's enough to really bother him, you know, or whatever. I don't want to hold him up, you know. The sooner I get finished, the sooner I get off this, out of this chair. And I'm thinking, so finally I thought, yeah, you know what, I... You know, maybe just a little bit more. No, we can't. Um, and sure enough, we put everything to hold and he zapped me up again and that was fine. By the time I went back, it was as though the Spirit of God had worked me over to the extent that, look, Todd, just get, just realize this is going to be a part of where you're going and just be, just settle it. And you know, I went back, he finished up the thing. I actually, I, I can't, you might not believe this because I can't believe it. I actually fell asleep in the chair. And not for a long period of time, but I caught myself waking up, you know, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden I had a profound sense of thankfulness for living in the day and age of Novocaine. <laughs> there are times that we run into a bunch of trouble. Sometimes, granted, we bring it on ourselves, but not always. Sometimes it, it's just a part of the world in which we live. But if there's anything out of those three phrases, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, if there's anything out of any of those three that the Holy Spirit wants to work on you about, I'd say, let Him have at it because there are things that we all need to learn. And there are things that we are all going through. There are things that we are all hoping for that haven't been fulfilled yet. But they will be. They will be. As sure as He went before us and lived and died on our behalf. His promises are true. And we will find out. It's only a matter of time. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for going before us, for your presence in all of this, for your not shying away from trouble, but reminding us to expect it for your honesty in all of this as to how life works. I thank you as well for these verses out of Romans 12. Practical, reminders, clear how you want to do 
what you will do in our midst. May you have your way. May you teach us, instruct us, lead us to become joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. We thank you for meeting us here. In Jesus' name, amen.